Thank you, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Karen said, I'm Chip Langan. I'm based in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and love to come over to Milwaukee as often as I can. I hear there's tap rooms and various things here, all because I need to study water more. You know, uh, actually, as I was leaving last night, I came in last night. Um, but as I was leaving my house in St. Paul, my 17-year-old, in his uh, usual way, says, "Dad, where are you going?" And so I'm going to the Water Council to give a presentation about federal contracting and water and all the opportunities. And he looks at me and he goes, "You don't know anything about water." Well, thanks, you know, it's a typical 17-year-old. And uh, in some ways, that's true. But I used to fly over it a lot, as Karen said. I was uh, uh, Navy for 21 years. I flew off of destroyers and. Uh, flew over the water a lot, looked down at it, and uh, always looked down on the battlefield and said, boy, it's got to suck down there. It's nice to be up here. So um, great career. And uh, in terms of knowing about water, uh, that's Karen's job and, and the Water Council. It's very, very impressive watching uh, this organization progress, uh, especially in terms of assisting small business. And, and I know a lot of you are small business people, uh, but looking at the invite list, I think I had, what, 30 or so, Karen, uh, registered for this. A real scattering of people, small business, large business, alliances, government. Uh, and so I was looking at that thinking, you know, how do I address all things uh, federal contracting and defense contracting as it relates to water and you know, relate that to these different kind of uh, stakeholders, so to speak, which is a challenge in an hour, hour and a half, uh, whatever we have here. Uh, but I'll try to hit on um, areas that will be useful in some way to all of you, uh, but by all means make this interactive. If something doesn't make sense, uh, if you can't hear me, uh, if you really don't think I'm an expert in water, as my son says, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand, including on GoTo, to do that. Um, so we are going to cover, uh, generally speaking, funding opportunities in the federal government uh, and defense, which of course is a part of the federal government. Uh, just as a quick aside here, though, I will say, um, as I can never let go of the Navy emphasis here, uh, shameless plug, there is a USS Minneapolis-St. Paul, uh, but it's not currently in the fleet. It's building right now. Does anybody know where this is building? Uh, yeah, Marinette Marine, uh, right here, just, what, two hours, two and a half hours uh, north up here. Uh, pretty great ship. It's a uh, littoral combat ship. Uh, and you'll notice the name here, Fincantieri. Uh, the Italians actually bought the shipyard and uh, modernized it, and they're, they're punching out Navy ships. So we're excited to commission this vessel uh, in the spring of 2020, hopefully in Duluth Harbor. Uh, we're going to convince the Navy to take it up through the lock and dam system over to Duluth and commission it. If you've never been to a Navy commissioning, uh, stay tuned and get over there to Duluth and in the spring in about a year and a half. should be an exciting event. There's a picture of the superstructure going on top of it. There actually is a littoral combat ship, same class, named USS Milwaukee. And this was commissioned, I don't know, something like four or five years ago. Uh, so there's a few of these ships uh, getting punched out right here in, in Wisconsin. A little background on uh, Defense Alliance. As Karen said, we were a uh, SBA-funded entity for about seven years. We've been around for about 15. Uh, and our funding for the uh, rep, uh, the uh, Regional Innovation Cluster Program ended last year. Uh, the Water Council is continuing to be funded under the SBA. We moved on to a private firm, which I'll go into a little bit. We're a network of companies, large, small, uh, and government and academia, a whole host of people that are residing in 34 states to do something for the defense industry, including water contractors. As I mentioned, our SBA funding expired. Uh, we merged with a for-profit company called LSI, Logistics Specialties, Inc. Uh, early last year, we have 60-some locations around the country. And in the merger with Defense Alliance, you'll see that this company had sites all over the country. Everywhere there were, there's federal presence. Uh, there's a yellow dot. That's where we exist. But there's a gap in the Midwest. And so Defense Alliance went to the uh, corporate headquarters and said, hey, we'll fill in that gap for you. We'll be your Midwest presence. So now Defense Alliance represents LSI here uh, in the Midwest. These are our core competencies. This is in the, the shameless plug category. If anybody, need, anybody needs extensive work in terms of 
um, truly diving into the federal market, the defense market, anything really federal, state, and local government contracting, uh, LSI is a, a strong player in the industry to do that for you. We understand one thing better than anybody else, and that's this. Does anybody recognize this? I hope you don't because you really wouldn't want to be alive if you really understood this. This is the defense contracting process. Uh, it's very hard to understand. Uh, I've been doing this, as I said, I was career military for 21 years, and I've been involved in the contracting process since I retired for about 15 years. So in and around this for 35 years, and frankly, I don't understand it. It's tough. Uh, and I say that up front here as we get into this, this uh, subject, because if you're not involved in it, you may look at this and go, oh man, that's just, that's too hard. And it is. The accounting processes, the legal portions, uh, the, the uh, requirements that go into just the terms and conditions of contract, it's burdensome and it's tough. So that's the hard part. Let's get that out of the way. Opportunities. The opportunities are vast. The largest customer in the world in terms of uh, buying, researching, studying, preserving, conserving water is the U.S. federal government. That's true about any product, uh, but certainly when it comes to uh, water. So the opportunities are vast. Uh, and so as a company, you really need to look at, do I really wanna dive into this in a strategic way uh, and, and deal with the, the challenges involved, building new relationships, understanding the process, updating your accounting systems to match what the government requires. Uh, if you're able to do that and match that investment for the government, the opportunities are enormous. And this is just a quick look at our staff. Good looking group, don't you think? Okay, so we're gonna cover basically four things today. I wanna talk about kind of the view from DC, uh, what's going on in federal government broadly, some large themes, because it really does trickle down to the contracts themselves. So we'll give you a kind of a federal market outlook. And then just a kind of an overview of the government itself, mostly the federal side, who's who in the zoo, uh, what are the requirements that the, the government's looking for in terms of water technology and process and engineering services and all that? Who are the agencies that, that actually contract with business uh, to acquire these things? Where are the opportunities and how do you access them? And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, working with the government itself, the strategies for success uh, to overcome those barriers that uh, are piece or, or part and parcel of that map that looks really complicated and it is. So not a very exciting topic, but we'll try to somehow make it that way. We'll put some trivia in here about uh, in each of these breaks to keep you guys uh, awake. I can watch the people in this room, but the people online, Karen, that's your job. Keep them, keep them uh, hopping there. Okay, the view from DC itself. Uh, I was just there, that's my hometown. It's, it's a complicated place. Uh, politics are raging right now, as, as most of you well know. Uh, D.C. was built on a swamp. It's below ground level. Uh, so there's some truth to people calling it a swamp, because it literally is. It's a landfill. Seriously, George Washington said, let's pick that. Let's fill in land there, and let's make that our capital city. A little crazy, but that's what's going on. So the heat, I think, makes people even more crazy. So there's a lot of spinning going around in, in, in D.C. Politics are tough. Uh, the administration uh, shift two years ago, roughly, uh, was a big shift. And I'm not talking politics here, but just the basics of uh, the outlook of the previous administration to the outlook of the current administration in terms of how they view government's role, what should be funded and how it should be funded. It was probably the biggest shift that I've seen. Uh, and the result of that has been really a lot of uncertainty uh, among the federal agencies that really care about water, and you'll see those later, Commerce, EPA, Interior, Forest Service, uh, EPA. There's been a lot of just waiting and seeing what are we gonna do uh, to shift our priorities and how we fund them when it comes to water and everything else. So I'm gonna cover just basically what I, what I view as uh, 10 overall federal priorities that have kind of filtered out now after about two years of this current administration. 
and again, it, these are kind of selected in the in the mindset of how does it relate to uh, people that care about water broadly, because you could sit down and come up with a hundred federal priorities, but these are some that kind of relate in some way. Number one, uh, as I'm sure you've seen this reflected from the very top. Uh, and that is there's a real emphasis now on trying to be more energy independent as a nation. And all of you are very connected to water. You know that uh, energy doesn't happen without water. That those two are part and parcel of the linked. But the federal government really hasn't understood that connection uh, until I think I would argue the last 10 years. It's been a real uh, effort to understand that and fund those two things uh, together. Number two, there's a real effort, and this is related to the first point, to fund contracts that reflect uh, what I call uh, adjacencies. So if you are looking at opportunities, let's say you are a water filtration system manufacturer or service provider, um, that's your one thing, that's your niche, that's what you care about. Uh, as you're approaching federal contracts, uh, keep this in mind, these two things in mind that um, the government likes to see uh, proposers, whether it be a small business or a large energy service company, that, that have these themes in mind and reflect that in proposals that you're writing for solicitations. Can you bring something else to the table in terms of your, your understanding of how your water filters fit in the broader system? Can you bring energy savings that eventually lead to energy independence? And literally use these words in your proposals, even if they're not asked for. If you can reflect those bigger themes, believe me, these topic authors, they're looking for that level of depth and understanding. So as niche as you might be, think about the broader themes and bring them to the table. Number three, made in the USA. Uh, you've seen this reflected, I'm sure, from the top on down. Uh, those of you that have been around long enough know that um, even if it says made in the USA because of the supply chain, a lot of things really aren't, right? But uh, there are a lot of things that are truly just done right here and nowhere else. If you are one of those manufacturers, uh, stand up and talk about that. Put it on your literature, put it in your proposals, uh, and not just the manufacturing itself, but talk about the jobs that are related. And if you're proposing something to the government to say, yeah, I can bring that to the table, uh, don't just say, by the way, it's all going to be made here or what, whatever high percentage is made here in the U.S., but will that contract provide new jobs here in the U.S.? Uh, try to reflect that in the proposals as well. Uh, this has been a theme forever, really, and that's, uh, well, should I say forever, really since the early 80s in government contracting. Uh, the Reagan administration started with uh, the Small Business Innovation Research Program. Uh, the theme of ensuring that any government contract reflects the fact that uh, if research principally is funded, it's going to lead to commercialized products or commercialized services. So even if you're doing an early stage research and development project, make sure that you're talking about uh, market potential, uh, market demand, and bring a business case to what you're talking about, even if it's something where I don't know, pick, a, pick an agency, uh, um, NIST or Department of Energy, which are not procurement agencies per se. Uh, and even if they don't specifically ask for what's your commercialization path, bring that to the table, talk about market demand, say things like, if you fund this basic research, I can turn it into applied research, I can turn it into commercial product, I can sell that overseas. Map that continuum out for them, even if it's just a paragraph in your proposals. Uh, ensuring more fair trade outcomes. Uh, this may be hard for you, as, as particularly as a small business, to say, well, how can I reflect that in a proposal? Uh, might be hard, but again, if you're strengthening the national technology base with your own technology or what you're proposing, uh, maybe there's a way for you to impact uh, fair trade in some way. Attracting foreign direct investment in U.S. industry. I, I, I don't know, Karen, maybe you've seen this in proposals from EDA recently, but this is a theme that's showing up uh, more and more. Uh, and I'm not sure where this is coming from, but uh, U.S. Commerce, I, I'm assuming uh, Small Business Administration, 
a lot of their solicitations now are saying, what can you do to reflect that what you're proposing has the prospects for foreign direct investment? And again, if you're a small component manufacturer, maybe that doesn't apply to you. Uh, but if you can um, talk about bringing partnerships to the table or attracting even you know, Canadian investment. Again, I'm in Minnesota. I work with uh, folks on the Iron Range, the Duluth area that are routinely bringing in partners from Canada. Uh, and they don't mention that to the federal government. Right now, that's a good thing to do. And that affects the trade imbalance as well. Research and development. Uh, this one really does apply to the water industry significantly uh, in terms of sustainment and resiliency. And I'm sure you all in this industry have heard those terms quite a bit. Uh, Department of Defense, which again is the biggest federal customer, cares a lot about uh, its facilities. You'll see some data later on how many facilities we have. Uh, anything you can do to show water savings, efficiencies uh, in those facilities or bringing, you know, uh, co-ops, partnerships together for large projects, looking at uh, sustainment goals for everything, the electric grid, the water capability, the recycling on a base or something. Um, what can you do to um, contribute to the national technology base? And that's a phrase too, don't be afraid to use that phrase. Uh, topic authors in DC that approve these things, especially the bigger projects, they care about those broader themes. Industry and public-private led initiatives. These are these have been around for years. The Water Council is an example of that. Defense Alliance is uh, in part publicly funded um, cooperatives, alliances that are advancing technologies. Uh, the government's been actively funding these for a while. Uh, there's more interest now in doing so in terms of uh, what can uh, entities like the Water Council do uh, to replace what the federal government is starting to get out of, and that's regulation. Uh, whether or not that continues uh, with the shift in administrations again or not, we don't know. Um, but my suspicion is that the government will continue to get out of that business, and there's still going to be a need to regulate the industry, conserve the environment. Uh, even those, those of us that think that the government regulates too many things, Life is balanced, right? So in the end, you do have to care about the environment and sustaining it. And so industry is gonna be asked to be a bigger part of that. And, and I would say if, if you are part of the Water Council, um, an official member, uh, again, back to the marketing piece, uh, put, that, put that on your, on your literature, uh, reflect the fact that you're part of a broader social impact alliance. Support for entrepreneurship, this has been, again, part of the federal um, mix really since the 80s in terms of contracting. But whatever you can do to show that you support uh, the growth of small business, the growth of jobs, even through your own business, uh, make sure that you do that. And finally, uh, again, this really relates to the shift in this administration. Obviously, we have a um, president now that comes from a business background very outcomes based, very fiscally based. Uh, even if you're doing a project for uh, EPA or, or uh, an agency that is looking more for sustainability or social impact, make sure you make a business case for what you're doing as well. And this relates to the commercialization paths that we talked about earlier. Um, because business outcomes currently, pardon the pun, uh, Trump environmental outcomes, if you can do both, that's a win-win for everybody. So reflect that if you can. In terms of uh, water spending the, on federal spending on water technologies broadly, I just kind of did some uh, brainstorming in terms of where the money is going and, and what the themes are. Uh, a lot of it is going into defense. You'll see some data on, on what the budget's doing there. Uh, made in the U.S., again, systems for uh, water technology and resiliency. If you can show that you're bringing partnerships together and growing jobs in the U.S., that's huge. Uh, Near-term technology, and what, I'm, what I mean there is there's been a lot of uh, 
in the previous administration, uh, research and development money that went into energy, water, waste, renewables, that funded things up to what we call technological readiness level five, six, seven, which is kind of mid-grade um, uh, technology or in terms of readiness. And it sat there on the shelf because the last administration didn't fund a lot of late stage and commercialized type work. This administration is eager to bring those things to the field now by actually going to that shelf that's pretty full of really cool things and funding late stage um, or, or near term technology. So if you have something that's a proof of concept, it's a prototype, uh, it's something that, you know, DOE did a lot of this where they would fund things up to TRL 567, uh, but there was no money to bring it to fruition. Uh, the government now finally, after about 10 years, is looking at that pretty significant portfolio of IP and saying, I like that, I like that, let's bring that to fruition. But you got to stand up and be recognized if you're one of those folks that has something like that on the shelf. Uh, and then procurement reform uh, is a piece of the, the puzzle right now. They've been trying to do that for 100 years, so we'll see where that goes. But uh, In terms of where the money is in water, just broadly speaking, in the federal government, uh, the bill that really relates here is the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Bill. Uh, and for fiscal year 19, it's $44.7 billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into that in terms of what water means, and this is water and energy combined, actually. But it's a $1.5 billion increase uh, from last year. And it's actually Congress plus this up by, I want to say, $15 billion compared to what the president requested. So uh, for those of you that think that, yeah, you know, this administration maybe is not funding uh, technologies as it relates to natural resources, uh, it's, it's not true. There's a lot of money out there, and it's actually increasing. Uh, where is it going? It's going to defense systems largely, largely in terms of installation, improving water facilities uh, on installations and bases, but also maintenance of waterways, uh, resilience of electrical infrastructure, basic science, building efficiency and energy programs. And the four agencies here I list are kind of the non-DOD uh, Department of Defense agencies where most of this money is, is going. As I said, the defense budget is a big piece of this. A large part of that def uh, water appropriations goes into defense. Uh, we're going from 535 billion to 715 billion, and we're gonna see 5% plus increases per year over the next at least five years, even if the administration shifts. Uh, one, you can't slow down the momentum even with a shift in presidential elections. It's gonna increase significantly for a lot of years here. A lot of program scrutiny. Uh, they're gonna cancel a lot of major programs like F-35, um, some big kind of wasteful programs, and a lot of that money is going to be put back into infrastructure and, and recapping the force. Money is going to go into readiness, broadly defined, which means more troops, uh, sustaining what we currently have as those major programs, frankly, get canceled. Uh, and sustainment is going to relate to engineering services and spare parts. And in terms of if you're looking for funding for water technologies, if you're if you're a company that does engineering services, uh, you can bring efficiencies to facilities, for instance, uh, be looking for pots of money right here in the sustainment piece, uh, maintaining old equipment on bases. A lot of money going into these areas too, cyber, special ops, shipbuilding, for instance, things like that. Uh, in terms of where water spending again is special operations, uh, the biggest uh, need of the, what's called the dismounted soldier in the field uh, the single soldier who's running around the desert, what's his biggest need? Does anybody know? No? That energy, it's a better battery. That's, by the way, that's the holy grail. If anybody invents a better battery here, you're, you're set for, for life. Uh, but number two is water. Uh, and it's, it's a huge priority for the Pentagon. And, and you, if you look back in history in terms of what they funded, there's been billions that has gone into better water conservation and creation actually even out of the air of water for the dismounted soldier and they still don't have it right so if you're into that technology there's a lot of money to be had there in late stage technology 
Uh, some of this money will be going into shipbuilding for desalination, more efficiency water use on ships, and of course back to energy independence as water relates to energy creation. And then enabling technologies, uh, these areas are critical for the DOD. And in terms of advanced processes, filtration, desalination, uh, and energy systems broadly, a uh, lot of new money going into water technologies in this, these areas for the DOD. All right, anybody glazing over yet? Karen, you're not enough, I see it. Okay, caffeine does wonders. So we'll cover some quick trivia here just to break it up a little bit. Um, against which of the following countries has the U.S. never officially been at war? Correct, Vietnam. Question two, what did President Reagan add as a new criteria for award of the Purple Heart? Injury or death from terrorism, sadly. Question three, the Marine Corps first land battle was a rescue mission. Where was it and who did they rescue? Somebody say Tripoli? Genius, yeah. Uh, Libya, Tripoli, Libya. And of course, they came to rescue the Navy as usual. Uh, the crew of the USS Philadelphia was kidnapped and they burned the ship to the waterline. The Marines had to come in and rough them up, so. So there you go. Okay, uh, into the second area, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, just the government broadly, who's who in the zoo, and what are the requirements. Uh, there's something in D.C. called the Congressional Research Service, a very little used entity uh, that's nonpartisan. I think it's part of OMB, Office of Management and Budget. Um, and, it's, and I say little used because it really it's, it's the research service for the Congress. And let's not forget the Congress works for you guys. So, yeah, a lot of dubious looks at it. Um, but if, you, if there's something you need in terms of research, if you have a good relationship with your congressional delegation, and we'll talk about that later, you should be able to go to that delegation and say to them, look, I'm trying to develop a market around fill in the blank, water purification. Uh, what's the market look like out there? What's the potential? Um, ideally, they could, they could, in a week, have substantial research back to you for free. Um, and again, it depends on the congressional delegation. Some are better at this. Some of them, you say Congressional Research Service, and they look at you funny. Uh, but most of them uh, know that it's a free resource for them and therefore for you. So if you want some information, um, tap into that if you can. I pulled out this one here, which was a study um, that looks at all water agencies in the federal government, uh, what the authorities are, what the committees are, where the policy is being made. Uh, this was from uh, May of 17, but it's the latest kind of uh, overall look at who's funding what in water. It's still applicable. And I can send you a copy of this if, if that's needed. Another kind of seminal document was done under the last administration. It's an executive order, 13693, planning for sustainability in the next decade, including water. And I won't bore you with this. It's, it's, it's a useful document, I think. And again, even though it's the last administration, to my knowledge, it's still valid as far as what the targets are for sustainability for this huge market called federal infrastructure installations. Um, and you'll see the acronym here, ESPC. Uh, I'll delve into that a little bit in a second. And what this executive order really reinforces in my mind is that these are government goals and they set really ambitious things. And you'll see some of those targets later in terms of saving water on federal installations. Uh, and there's no way they're gonna reach these targets. Certainly not on their own. One, they're too ambitious. And two, the technology doesn't reside within the federal government. It resides in this room and, and in the audience to go to meeting. And the government is sitting there waiting for you to come to them. And even though it's complicated to get there, uh, they're excited when you arrive, uh, if you have something that, that, that you can bring to the table. One of the biggest ways this is done, and these are large projects admittedly, but it's something called the Energy Savings Performance Contract, ESPC which allows federal agencies to contract with um, approved vendors. And these tend to be big ones. 
uh, like you heard, so the examples include Lockheed Martin, ABM, Honeywell, Siemens, Train. Uh, I try to pull out some ones I think do a lot of uh, water technologies. And what the federal government does is they approve these vendors through a competitive process, semi-competitively, and they say, okay, Honeywell, we need you to look at these four bases and approve water efficiency on them. Honeywell, as, as, as with apologies to some of the big primes here, a lot of the innovation doesn't reside within the big prime contractors, right? It resides within the small businesses, the supply chains that represent those bigger companies. So the Honeywell will turn around and look for who can bring filtration, who can bring purification, who can bring um, renewable energy projects to a set of bases, and they'll be subcontracting to folks like you. But you gotta look, look for these things in order to find them. The uh, website for the DOE portion of that is, is uh, listed here. So I mentioned some of those targets uh, that the federal government has, has set out for itself, uh, and I won't read this, but you'll see some pretty ambitious goals. Um, cutting potable water, for instance, by 36% uh, by 2025. Um, going to more net zero. Uh, I assume that term is familiar with you folks. Um, net zero installations where a base, for instance, is totally off the grid in terms of electrical and water use. Uh, again, very ambitious goals. Uh, there's five pilots in the DOD, uh, Fort Bragg, I don't know the five bases offhand, um, but there's those, those ESCO projects, a lot of them are those net zero bases that are trying to bring um, piloted technologies to figure out how to be net zero, and that'll filter down across eventually to all bases. There was a, a White House Water Summit in uh, 2016, and I know the, the director of the Water Council this morning said that he had just been to the White House. So some of these meetings are continuing. The last big summit, I believe, was under the last administration. And this document, uh, which again, I can send you if you need it, or you can Google it, uh, lists some pretty good resources in terms of what the government is doing in terms of connecting to, federal, uh, to industry partners uh, to get access to capital funding, uh, partnerships, things like that. I mentioned the uh, resources that are available through your congressional delegation. Uh, I know Wisconsin has a, has a very strong delegation, frankly, compared to Minnesota's in terms of its knowledge, its interconnection to resources within the federal government. This is just an example of one from New York. Senator Gillibrand uh, has uh, put together just for her constituency um, a list of what she views as the most uh, applicable um, resources and pots of money for uh, con constituents in the New York area. Okay, a little bit more about the uh, the DOD water world and the substantialness of it. Um, and I won't read these, but you can see the size of what the DOD represents. Uh, you add up the uh, facilities, the footprints of DOD buildings, it's 15,000 square miles, bigger than states combined. Uh, water resource management remains a key operational requirement for the DOD. And here you can see the total annual use of industrial uh, water. Uh, I didn't know that figure, is that trillion or whatever, so, but yeah, 10 trillion gallons a year. You know, I don't even think Lake Superior has that much, but uh, the, the need is there and the, the need to figure out how to sustain and um, save water is, is just, it just never ends. And again, I mentioned the Net Zero Initiative. The Army leads that, but it's filtering down into uh, Navy and Air Force bases now. And a lot of these have become state-based projects. Uh, either ESCO projects or state agencies have taken them over and they work in partnership with the Department of Defense to bring renewable projects to uh, bases to improve um, water use. Yeah, yeah, anytime, go ahead. I don't know the answer to that, but I can, get that if you want to email that to me Karen I can look into that for sure I know there was a, there was a huge raft of uh, RFPs requests for proposals that went out as they do after every natural disaster 
if if any of you are in uh, sales or business development in your companies, um, track storms. And uh, if you see a natural disaster, this sounds kind of cold, but there's opportunity in that. Uh, and Department of Homeland Security primarily, uh, but also DOT, actually Department of Justice, oddly enough. Uh, there's a lot of federal contracts that get let right after emergencies for uh, portable water consumption, um, electrical generation, things like that. And obviously Puerto Rico is a huge one in terms of sustaining the water base there. That was an issue, but I can certainly find that out. Back to the facilities again, 30 million acres, 5,000, right? That's a picture of where the Ark of the Covenant is kept, of course. Um, and the DOD water rolled out, I'll break this down a little bit. It's either, uh, this is the way I break it down. Um, if you're looking for opportunities, think either facilities, and that's mostly US based, but it's some overseas uh, bases, uh, logistical depots, um, any, any federal land, and there's some, even in Wisconsin, there's federal facilities here. Um, those are a lot of infrastructure needs, HVAC, renewable energy, solar panels, water, um, kitchen facilities, and then operational stuff. This is more the uh, purification for the dismounted soldier, desalination on ships, things like that. Um, an example of a company, we're actually meeting with a colleague of mine is meeting with Roving Blue today. Uh, in Mena, Wisconsin. Uh, that's a company I'll talk a little bit more about later, but they've really capitalized on that operational side of what the DOD needs in terms of water. Great Wisconsin company. Okay, who to know in those two areas? Uh, it's really too hard to break down, quite frankly, there's too many people. But again, if you think of it in terms of facilities, if you fit their um, Office of Secretary of Defense, OSD, does installations. There's a Deputy Secretary of Defense just for installations. That's where the policy starts and it filters down into acquisition and then to initial bases. Um, that's where to chase those opportunities. Uh, same thing with Office of Secretary of Defense acquisition technology and logistics. They care about more of the efficiencies involved. On the Navy side, there's Naval Facilities and Naval Sea Command. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers does a lot of projects related to infrastructure, as, as most of you know. And in terms of operations, again, there's too many uh, agencies to mention, but uh, one of the leaders in terms of really moving technology and innovation in water is uh, the Marine Corps office uh, called E2O, Energy Efficiency Office, I believe it is. Uh, Naval Facilities Command, again, um, Special Operations Command actually does a lot of work with purification, uh, creation of water out of oxygen in the air, things like that. And then Natick Soldier Center, that's the Army piece. Uh, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And in terms of health and standards, if you're into um, water in terms of its uh, safety and cleanliness, and uh, especially post-disaster, the U.S. Army is very heavily involved in that, Institute of Public Health. I mentioned the Natick Soldier Center just to show you an example of one thing they do. There's, there's dozens of projects all the time at Natick. Uh, this is an example of something called air droppable water storage and heating and cooling unit. Uh, a lot of these projects, I mentioned those things, they fund to about TRL level seven and then they sit there. This is probably an example of one of those that just sat there because the Army probably looked at that and said, well, that's cool, but it's too heavy and it's gonna break, be my guess. Uh, and I won't belabor this, but in terms of facilities, a lot of uh, Department of Defense goals are out there, as I mentioned. Um, and again, if you're a small company, you look at this and you're going to say, well, I, I can't reduce potable water by 26%. But can you bring half of 1% solutions to the table? That's huge. Find a way to do that. And if you can do that in partnership with another company, uh, the federal government loves when you bring more than one small business to the table. Um, makes them really excited. You just do something in partnership, along with the big business as well, but they love those teams of small businesses. And again, there's just, there's too many examples to mention, but uh, 
the Army, for instance, is always looking at, uh, in order to achieve those broader goals, what can we do on one, one small base? Here's an example of Fort Carson is trying to reduce their potable water consumption by 50%, for instance. This is an ongoing project that has not been solved. Uh, in terms of the operational side, uh, can you bring something to the table that re achieves one of these capabilities for um, a Department of Defense customer? Can you reduce the equipment size? You saw that air droppable purification unit at Natick. Um, that's probably not an example of something that's been reduced to a smaller size. Can you find a way to do that? Can you find a way to do on-site water production and actually purification? Uh, can you give that dismounted soldier the ability to carry instead of uh, 10 bottles of water, which is the current way to get water to the battlefield, it's, it's the bottle of water. Can you find a way to reduce it from 10 bottles to five and have him create the other five in some other way? Uh, they're always looking, this is Marine Corps driven uh, almost exclusively. Can you find a way to improve the way water is stored at forward operating bases? That's what a FOB is. Can you simplify the logistics chain? Uh, the number one uh, logistics challenge is getting fuel to the battlefield. Back to the energy and batteries, battery side. Number two, again, is water. Anything you can do to reduce those giant water buffaloes, those trucks uh, coming to the battlefield um, to simplify the logistical solution is, is a goal. And again, water is part of the total system at forward operating bases. Um, again, think systems. If you're, uh, again, bringing something hydroelectric power generation is something the DOD has toyed with. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are doing this. Uh, Verterra Energy is in Minneapolis. They throw little turbines in the water and produce Electricity, anybody here doing that? It's cool stuff, um, but it's never enough power. So make it better. Is yours better? I think so. Good. All right. Well, if you want to talk about it, let me know. It's, uh, you're, you're in a tough field. It's very competitive. Uh, and then desalination. I know Water Council is primarily fresh water. Um, but desalination is still a huge challenge uh, for the Navy, both in installations and on ships as well. Uh, some service specific examples. Uh, the Marine Corps, again, is a leader, I think, in terms of the operational side of things, but not always. The Air Force actually dabbles in some ground equipment, uh, as does the Army. Um, but the Marine Corps is always looking to reduce the size and weight for the soldier. Here's just some basic requirements they're looking for. Um, 40 gallons per day. Uh, is what they need for a squad, essentially, which is, I forget, eight or ten men. Um, yeah, be with the customer. Okay, so again, back to the process. Um, uh, really, it comes down to finding the requirements. If you have a technology, you make a, a water turbine, do you, a turbine, do you meet the requirements that are out there? How do you find these things? This is a challenge. A lot of publications and websites. Um, the uh, the Pew Charitable Trust, if you know Pew, um, they do a lot of great studies for the Department of Defense. All these things are available online in terms of um, if you if you Google water sustainability for defense, you'll probably find a Pew research study. All kinds of great data in there uh, that's still relevant, even if these studies are five, six, seven years old. You can also go to something called Defense Innovation Marketplace. And again, a lot of these things, this is a federal government presentation, but it's very heavily defense centric, not just because that's my background, but because a lot of these requirements are driven by defense needs and then are driven into other federal opportunities. You can also find requirements by connecting to trade groups and professional organizations. Each service has a uh, civilian support branch like the Association of the U.S. Army, the Navy League, uh, National Defense Industrial Association, of course, us, Defense Alliance, and the Water Council. Stay close. Uh, but the real key in terms of finding requirements, of course, is, is being with the customer. Uh, a lot of folks look at the Department of Defense or just the federal government and say, 
you know, I really, I really can't play there. That's not me. They won't talk to me. It's not true at all. Uh, remember, they work for us. Uh, and you have access right in your backyard in terms of uh, deployable soldiers, the Wisconsin National Guard, the Minnesota National Guard. Those units now are central to operations overseas all the time, not just in high surge times. They're always deploying. And a lot of these units are on the leading edge of needs and requirements for water use. So talk to your guardsmen. All right, any questions? Any more questions, Karen, at this point? All right. All right, so some more trivia. For what special U.S. Coast Guard unit did Walt Disney create this logo in 1942? It's a duck of some kind, right? Yeah. The Corsair fleet. So when World War II kicked off uh, in earnest in early 1942, we didn't have much of a Coast Guard, uh, and frankly, much of a Navy. And so they enlisted uh, civilian forces on the, or civilian boats on the East Coast to look for submarines. Yeah. So there you go. What U.S. government facility in Washington, D.C. did not get destroyed during the War of 1812? The U.S. Patent Office. And why? Because uh, back then, war was a little bit more gentlemanly, and the head of the U.S. Patent Office actually walked up to the British encampment with a white flag, introduced himself, and said, look, I, you know, I'm part of the U.S. Patent Office, and there's a lot of IP that we're collecting in that building, and you really don't want to burn that to the ground. In case you capture the city, you might want to, you know, keep that. So, sure enough. But everything else, yeah, they burned the uh, the White House, the Capitol, the Navy Yard. Rude. When did Germany make its last reparation payment for World War One? This one blew me away. 2010. Germany paid reparations for World War I until 2010 uh, to the tune of $12.5 billion. Pretty cool. <clears throat> and some amazing headwear, too. Okay, uh, the next topic, we're going to discuss kind of some of those funding agencies now that are under the federal government more broadly. Uh, what are the opportunities? Where are they? And how do you access them? A lot of research and development in, in water technologies and energy. And a lot of this funding goes up to the proof of concept stage. Uh, this will be funded by CERTIP and ESTCP. I won't go into those acronyms now because I'm going to do some later. A lot of the long-term technology uh, is SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, uh, which has a sister STTR, Small Business Oh, I forget the T's in that one, but it's, it's an SBIR, but it's partnering with academic institutions. Uh, yes, technology transfer. Thank you. And uh, that's kind of a three to seven year timeline. Um, and so if you're looking for uh, funding something that's proof of concept, uh, or you think it'd probably take three to seven years to really get this to commercialization, uh, that's really that first program, CERTA, ESTCP, or SBIR. Move into the later stage technology, moving something off the shelf into commercialization. They tend to be broad agency announcements, BAAs, contract vehicles. And then there's a new one, well, relatively new, it's four years old. This is the replacement for congressional earmarks. I think most of you probably have heard of congressional earmarks, and they went away, allegedly. Well, the Department of Defense found a way to recreate earmarks because they said, hey, those were pretty good for us and we liked what we got. So they created a, a funding vehicle using a broad agency announcement called the Rapid Innovation Fund. Uh, this one just was left. So the next one won't come out until spring of next year. But it might be worth perusing that because that's looking at the major services and the Secretary of Defense itself for what are the requirements they have to have in 18 months, 18 to 24 months. That's considered urgent technology in the Pentagon, two year timeline. Um, and there's been traditionally five or six water topics that are in there. 
worth looking at. Uh, a lot of opportunities if you if you search for technology demonstrations, the Marine Corps, I mentioned the E2C office, uh, they do some, or E2O office, they do something called E2C, which is their energy challenge. Uh, every year they do either West Coast or East Coast, um, a chance for small business to come out and demonstrate your technology on your own dime, but it's a good way to get noticed uh, in front of the services. A lot of good technology challenges out there. I know Water Summit is talking about creating <clears throat> a technology challenge here. Uh, Naval Postgraduate School does a good one. The Army does a good one. Uh, Defense Innovation Summit exists. Uh, there's, I think it's two conferences a, a year. It used to be called Defense Energy Summit, uh, and now it's called the Defense Innovation Summit. <clears throat> but there's a really neat um, uh, challenge that you can enter as a small business real simple uh, proposal, just a one pager online, basically to ask to present your technology at one of these uh, two innovation summits. And the neat thing is anybody who's anybody in terms of energy and water in the federal government shows up at these things. It's usually in Austin, I think, which is becoming an increasing hub for innovation. Um, they show up and, and you can present in front of all the policy and acquisition folks in the federal government. Great opportunity. We've had Oh, I want to say 12 members of the Defense Alliance that have applied and had a chance to present, uh, at least three or four of which have led the contracts for them. So highly recommend doing that. Uh, federal business opportunities is where you go search for these things. I will cover that a little bit more in detail. And of course, there's grants and loans, uh, which is a related topic. But uh, if, if you're not familiar with Small Business Administration and their loan programs, uh, we can certainly provide access to that. The contract vehicles themselves, again, if you're looking at um, research and technology, it's really three to seven years, it says three to five here, but that's the SBIR, broad agency announcement to some degree, and then the cooperative research and development agreements. If you're willing to kick in a match of usually 50% uh, in terms of moving a technology forward with the federal government, uh, a CRADA is, is a good way to go. Uh, and, and also, in terms of that investment, too, the government loves when you can bring some level of investment to the table. So if you're applying for something, that's another thing you drop into a proposal to say, well, our investment in R&D is going to be 10% of this project or whatever you can afford. The 18 to 24 month projects are, again, broad agency announcements or that rapid innovation fund. There are some off-the-shelf technologies, of course, uh, GSA schedule. If you have something that's ready to go, it's packaged and you know, a water filter or something, uh, take a look at GSA schedule. That's the government's shopping mall, essentially. Uh, the best way to get notice on there is to have a part number approved by the government. Does anybody here have a part number approved by the government? Yeah, great way to go. If, if you don't, know how to do that. It's a complicated process and it usually involves a sponsor, usually a prime contractor that can do that for you, um, but not always. There's, there's, a, there's a process. And then there's some really urgent stuff where the DOD needs something right now, which is 90 days. <clears throat> and that's the rapid equipping force, uh, other transaction authority. There are a few programs out there where the DOD or the federal government can bypass its own procurement process and not be competitive uh, to, to get what they need very quickly. Those are hard to find. You usually have to go through, again, a major prime contractor or a defense alliance or something like that to find those programs. How do you search for these things? Uh, FedBizOps, anybody use FedBizOps routinely? It's uh, cumbersome, it's ugly. Um, but I just, I went to the other day, you can uh, put in water and purification uh, you got some search tips here. There are some things you can do to narrow down this process. This came up with, this is actually a search from last year. This came up with 47 opportunities that are current for water and purification. Uh, I went to a, a, a tool that we used yesterday called GovWin, which is a subscri subscription tool that we use in Defense Alliance and LSI that breaks things down a lot better than FedBizOps. Uh, if you're truly going to embrace the federal market, uh, it might be worth doing. It reveals a lot of partnership opportunities with small businesses, market trend analysis, reports. But GovWin for small business, I think it's 15000 a year roughly. Yeah, 
but it's a pretty big investment. But again, if you're going to embrace the federal market, there, there's no better tool for this. That's what we use. I did a search yesterday for just water um, keyword, 2,800 opportunities, 280 billion in total contract value among those opportunities, uh, with the average one being $98 million. So again, it, it, it's a tough business, but there's a lot of money out there. Uh, just some sample topics from that group of thousands of opportunities, water manifolds, dispensers, purification, uh, technical support, assemblies, chemicals, industrial water treatment, uh, water and soil studies. And again, this is just eight or nine of hundreds of topics that are out there. <clears throat> you can also search kind of the late stage technologies, I mean the early stage technology opportunities at uh, sbir.gov. Uh, I did water again yesterday, got 12 matches. SBIR topics, they come and go, they're quarterly. DOD, I think it's three times a year. Um, and it's, it's, it's good to search these things routinely. Sometimes, depending on the, on the cycle, you'll see nothing for water. And then you go back to the next quarter and you'll see 38 topics. Um, yesterday, it revealed some kind of odd ones. They're looking for water for animal research, Alzheimer's. I didn't delve into these, but there's a connection somehow to, to water technologies. NAICS code. Does anybody not know what a NAICS code is? North American industry classification system, I think. Uh, every business, uh, most businesses that do uh, any, any kind of uh, technology work probably have a NAICS code, same for service providers. And if you're registered in the uh, system for award management, federal government system as an approved vendor, you need to list your NAICS codes, so you need to know what they are. Uh, among those thousands of opportunities that I found, these are the top NAICS codes that came up for water. So, and it's, I know it's hard to read, but if you see uh, something that applies to you, again, um, you can also search by, by NAICS code. Some of the funding agencies themselves, uh, Department of the Interior does some work in water, the Bureau of Reclamation, excuse me, mostly with dams, power plants, and canals, uh, and mostly in the western states. Funding usually comes through congressional legislation and then goes to local governments. So if you're interested in this type of work around uh, power generation, um, water flow and canals and things like that, uh, you might go to interior reclamation, not find much. But in this case, you might go to the Wisconsin Procurement Institute, for instance, WPI. Um, some of the money from interior may be coming through them or they know where it's going in the state. Uh, to access to this type of technology. Here's one example of one. This is a cooperative agreement. I mentioned that type, um, looking for small scale water efficiency, small contract, $75,000 project of some kind due the 31st of July. I'm seeing as I present, Karen, the people dropping off here, their little queue. So. so it might be time to go back to trivia, right? So. Um, Department of Energy, obviously, because of the connection to water, uh, funds a lot of um, water-related projects. DOE tends to fund things that don't lead to commercialized products, but sometimes they do. I mean, they're not a procurement agency like Department of Defense. But again, if you're trying to move proof of concept, uh, this is a great place to go look for opportunities. They have a lot of good industry reports uh, online as well. Here's one about hydropower uh, right here on the DOE website. Uh, Department of Defense has had great uh, luck moving innovation through something called DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agencies. So uh, the internet, duct tape, I don't know, all the cool stuff that Velcro we got from uh, Defense usually was created by DARPA. Uh, because of that and because of the agreement that DOD now has with DOE, uh, DOE decided to create their version of DARPA, Advanced Research Project Energy Agency Energy, ARPA-E. Um, we were just visiting with them two weeks ago in DC. A lot of kind of new energy going into uh, ARPA-E right now. No pun intended. Um, 
And again, they've reached that point after two years of the new administration. They finally know where they're going. They know the vision. So if you've, if you've kind of given up on RPE in the past two years, I know a lot of our companies did, you might want to go revisit what they're doing. <clears throat> they do a lot of really interesting workshops in DC too around specific topics. Here's one example of water desalination. Uh, this one's due 22 December. And I mentioned the workshops here. They're doing one on marine hydrokinetic energy uh, on July 26th. It's my birthday, so I think you guys should go and celebrate the DC. Okay, I mentioned that horrible acronym earlier, CERTIP. Uh, this is the Strategic Environmental R&D Program for the DOD. And you'll see under their logo there, it says DOD, EPA, DOE. Uh, so again, this department is defense driven, but they look to the EPA and the Department of Energy for guidance on, on policy behind these programs. This is a way um, uh, to get an annual solicitation out there to engage academia industry, uh, to look for high quality research around just energy uh, generally, which includes water. Here's some of the project areas, conservation of water, treatments. Uh, a lot of folks go look at these opportunities in CERTIP and they don't see a lot of funding. And that's true. Sometimes there's pilot project funding. Sometimes it's CRADA where you have to bring in your own investment. But in terms of getting noticed in the federal sphere, in terms of innovation in water, uh, if you're not involved in CERTIP or ESTCP, you know, you're not going to get noticed that much, is my opinion. Uh, so if you can bring um, connection to these two programs into proposals and other agencies that, yeah, we're working with CERTIP, we're working with the STCP, we've done a prototype project for them, that has huge credibility associated uh, with it. The other one is ESTCP, and this is really the validation program. So if you have something that you think brings a true solution to the table, like more efficient water generation with a power generator, hydro. Uh, this is a way for you, in some cases, to get funding to do a pilot project or a study uh, to put your thing in the water and get some test data out of it. And there is an annual solicitation around this one as well. And again, back to the credibility piece, ESTCP tests your technology, maybe they fund it, maybe they don't, uh, but you're gonna get some data and you're gonna get that check the block certification basically that you can market. And again, just some examples of what ESTCP funds, your stormwater treatment and wastewater treatment. And again, they're always looking for ways to demonstrate more efficient uh, use of uh, water on the battlefield and installations. There is a newsletter, like a lot of these agencies, you can subscribe to an online newsletter. Um, there it is, certif-estcp.org. Uh, National Science Foundation, they, I went here yesterday, they have 64 open solicitations that. Uh, relate to water management of stormwater, water for cooling, for thermal cycle power plants, innovations at the nexus of food, energy, and water systems. Sounds like a great project for the Water Council. Uh, improving water quality and protecting and enhancing water resources. And again, this is just one look at one agency yesterday, 64 open solicitations. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of navigation, flood damage reduction, uh, community assistance projects. Um, these, although U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is, is part of the Department of Defense, it really is kind of a rogue separate agency. Uh, they don't do any battlefield type stuff. This is really uh, national water infrastructure. Uh, and this stuff is always broken, as we know. So there's always projects out there. Department of Agriculture funds water projects. And they have loans and grants, EPA, same thing. A lot of municipal stuff with EPA. And again, a lot of these funding vehicles, you go search for it, you don't see it. That's because the money's been put down into the states. States further dole that out. Another example of an agency that does a lot of water work, obviously, is the Department of the Navy. 
Um, and again, some of this stuff you might go there and, and find the keywords takes you to things like uh, better thermodynamic uh, capabilities of hulls in the water, and that's why the water popped that up. So it's more more naval design. But there's an amazing amount of water technology too in terms of uh, water use on ships uh, and on the battlefield for seals, things like that. Here's just one topic I pulled out of here yesterday, which is a current broad agency announcement. They're looking for efficient generation of energy and purified water at points of consumption. So folks that are at a forward operating base, for instance, Navy SEALs. The nice thing about a broad agency announcement vehicle like this is uh, the word broad is there for a reason. Where a SBIR is looking for something very specific. Uh, I want a better flange on that flywheel. That might be an SBIR topic, believe it or not. A broad agency announcement will be something like, uh, we want to go to Mars, so we need better ways to have water along the way. So the nice thing about BAAs is you can come in and define the topic or just a piece of it and say, I can bring this piece to the table. And the other nice thing about BAA vehicles is you can define the, the amount. The average award is about $3 million for a small business but there's really no limit. If you bring something to the table that the DOD really wants or the federal government really wants, you, know, you, can, you can dictate a $20 million ask or whatever it is. Another tip, don't ever ask for anything less than a million dollars. If you, if you have something that you're convinced it just, just needs that extra 500,000, right? How many small business owners out here say, God, if I just had another half million, I could do X. Don't ever say that to the Department of Defense or the federal government. You need at least one million or more. And I, and I would say 2.5 is kind of an average ask. Because one, it doesn't look as serious. And number two, they're probably gonna give you half what you ask for anyway. So. Uh, quick examples of, again, this is pulled out of uh, that Navy Broad Agency announcement. Oh no, I'm sorry, this is the Rapid Innovation Fund. Uh, US Pacific Command looking for broad spectrum halogen free individual water purification. Again, up to 3 million bucks for the RIF. Uh, these proposals were due in April. The next one will be you know, the usual cycle. Now's the time, by the way, if you think, if you go back and look at the RIF, and I recommend that you do, look for those water topics. It's a great kind of treasure trove in terms of business intelligence. You can find out uh, what the DOD, what the federal government, federal government is looking for, uh, points of contact, phone numbers, emails. Again, they work for us. So feel free to call them, pester them, be that company that keeps showing up and saying, I can do this, I can do this. And if you don't see a topic reflected, but you know you can bring something to the table based on your knowledge of requirements that you see more broadly that the federal government needs, suggest a topic. Uh, that's, that's the ultimate uh, goal for a small business working with the federal government. If you can convince them they need what you have, Get them to write a competitive RFP. When it comes out, guess who it's been written for? Even though it's competitive, you provided the design inputs, you're going to win it. Another example out of the RIF last year, enhanced contingency base camp modeling tools. So this is something more software based, uh, looking for reductions in fuel and water. Uh, just a quick description of that Marine Corps Expeditionary Energy Concepts demonstration, uh, annual technology demos by small business. Submissions are due in January every year. They're very simple submissions. I want to say three to five page white paper. Uh, you're accepted usually by April and then you come out to the desert either in California or the swamps of North Carolina, I think it is, and you demonstrate uh, your product in the field for about a week. And you get Marines to try to break it, which they're really good at doing. So good way to get design inputs for your, for your project. There it is, Camp Lejeune or Camp Pendleton, east or west coast. Uh, I mentioned the Defense uh, Tech Summit. Uh, this is held every year. Uh, it's moved to Tampa now. It wasn't Austin. Uh, this year it's down in Tampa, Florida in October. Uh, good time to leave Wisconsin and go down there. Uh, there was an Asia-Pacific Resilience Innovation Summit that had a lot to do with water. Uh, I don't know if they still do this one. I haven't checked. The last one was July of 17. I think they might have skipped 18, but it's in Hawaii, so why would you not try to go out there? 
Government Services Administration, GSA. Again, this is the government shopping mall for all things off the shelf. So if you have an off the shelf project, product or service, uh, you may consider getting on the GSA schedule. Another big investment just to set this up is probably to do it right, is probably a 10 to $15,000 investment of time and resources to get on the GSA schedule and maintain it. Uh, GSA has something also called the Green Proving Ground. Uh, I recommend doing this. Go to gsa.gov slash green proving ground. Uh, and this is hit and miss. It depends on the time of year, but you'll see projects roll through in these different areas, uh, including water conservation uh, and reuse. And this is an opportunity to provide, and it's really just to get noticed, um, submit a white paper, get GSA to notice you, uh, and that will turn into either come out and tell us more in DC, or that sounds cool, or contact an agency, see if we can get a competitive RFP written for that topic. Uh, again, it's time and investment, but a uh, good way to go if you want to get noticed. And then there's a scattering of other folks that do water-related uh, technology, the Bureau of Indian Affairs of all places. Uh, they, this agency gets $58 billion a year. Uh, direct to the tribes. Uh, a lot of that money is not well spent. Uh, BIA will say that themselves. Uh, they have a new program called the Native American Business Development Initiative, which is an attempt to take some of that $58 billion a year and turn it into jobs, industry and jobs. Uh, there's something called uh, the NABD, I mentioned that, Native American Business Development Initiative. You can write a 10-page proposal to suggest Hey, federal government, give us a year and 100,000 bucks to study putting a factory on a, on a reservation to build X. Uh, if, if the pilot project or the proof of concept uh, succeeds, you can ask for BIA uh, to fund the building of a, fa of a factory. Uh, doesn't happen very often. I was just at BIA in DC two weeks ago. And they say, hey, we put this call out every year. People just don't take us up on it. Um, they're waiting for ideas for industry to come in and say, um, we can, if we build a manufacturing plant, let's do it on a reservation. Let's create jobs. The federal government come and build your factory for you. It's amazing. And then some other scattering of agencies, HUD, Commerce, uh, fund things periodically. And again, you can find this on FitBizOps or through GovWin. Uh, I mentioned a lot of these dollars come from the feds directly to the states, uh, and then it's hard to access them. Uh, you guys are fortunate. You have a really good procurement technical assistance center here called WPI. If you're not familiar with them, I'd recommend you connect to them. I did a search on their system yesterday. There's 15 opportunities related to water, uh, environmental consulting, water treatment, heating and cooling is what I found. And then similar to, to uh, GovWin, there's search tools that do a pretty good job with state and local government procurement, Envia, Deltec. Uh, but again, these are investments. These are expenses for companies. So if you want to find uh, contacts, it's, contracts, it's a good way to go. I'd go to WPI. It's cheaper. All right, who's, who's winning contracts? Uh, if you're in business, you probably have competitors. Even if you're one of those businesses that says, nobody does what we do, it's never true. Um, so you want to find out who's a competitor and who's getting federal contracts that you're not getting. The nice thing about federal dollars is it's all public, right? So you can go find out who's winning what. Uh, there is something called Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS. Don't go there. Go to usaspending.gov. It's a better system. Uh, really uh, advanced search capabilities. I just did this yesterday. I went in and searched contracts around water filtration for 2018, so the ongoing fiscal year. This goes till September 30 this year. And I put in Wisconsin, I put in prime contracts. I got 130 contracts, five grants. There's a contract somewhere here in Wisconsin for $5 billion around water filtration. Probably not one of you guys, right? And the smallest one, I don't get this, which is for $81. I don't understand what that is, but. I didn't bother to research that. And it's listed by company and location, and the points of contact. So you can find out a lot about your competition if they're doing federal contracting. 
and try, go try to steal some of this away. All right, back to military trivia. Karen's nodding off again. All right, question seven. Dwight Eisenhower had orders to flight school in 1915. Why did he not go to flight school? Colorblind, his fiance's dad said no way. He was considered too intelligent. Army ran out of planes due to crashes. His fiance's dad said no way. Because back then, 1915, orders to flight school meant you wouldn't live beyond like age 18. So, so if you're marrying my daughter, you're not going to flight school. And it's probably a good thing he didn't because he wouldn't have become president of the United States. Maybe it were. What does the tattoo of a gold turtle signify on a sailor's arm? I didn't know this one. That means you've crossed the date line and the equator where they intersect. Very exciting. How they did that before GPS, I have no idea. Uh, okay, there's a, there's a Marine Corps helicopter squadron called HMX-1. That's those green and white helicopters that fly the president based in Quantico. Why don't the pilots of HMX-1 wear flight suits? They don't look cool enough. The first lady asked why the president's passengers don't have to. They're really vain. The Secret Service mandated it. The first lady poked her head in the cabin one day as they were embarking the aircraft and said, why are you guys in flight suits? And the pilot said, well, in case we crash and there's a fire, we're not going to burn because these flight suits are, you know, good to 800 degrees or something. So the first lady looks at her chiffon dress and says, well, what about us? So the very next day, they started wearing Charlie's, which is the, just the khaki shirts and the blue pants. <laughs> Anybody know which first lady that was? Who, who dressed really elegantly? Jackie Onassis, yeah. So ever since then, they... Stop wearing flight suits. Uh, true or false, the U.S. has seven uniformed services. That's true. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. Anybody know the other two? The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the U.S. Public Health Service, both of which wear naval-inspired uniforms because they're the coolest. All right, how are we doing, Karen? Are we doing good? Perfect. All right, uh, uh, working with the government, uh, some strategies for success. <clears throat> I like top 10 lists, so here we go again. Uh, as I said, this is a really challenging business. The opportunities are vast. How do you succeed overall? Number one, uh, you've really got to get engaged in systematic searching of these contracts because they come and go, uh, they vary in scope, the topics change, and unless you've got some systematic way to uh, put in some keywords and be notified of those, those opportunities, you're going to miss them. Uh, most of these websites, including FedBizOps, but that's a cumbersome system, but certainly GovWin, you can set up a basically a uh, template where you put in your technology, your keywords, your thresholds for contracts, anything you want, and you get an email alert when everything's changed. Fantastic. Uh, Wisconsin Procurement Institute or any Procurement Technical Assistance Center, VTEC, will also do that for you. They'll set up a system that's called Bid Match. Uh, I think there's a fee for that now. I'm not sure, but it's not much for small business. So if you want somebody to systematically set that up for you, uh, I recommend doing it. Uh, relationship development is key. If you're involved in sales or business development, you know that it's a relationship game. Um, do you have the best technology? Okay, that's great. Do you know the, the, the procurement officer? You know, sometimes that's better. Um, it's not a fair system although it's designed to be, uh, but are you the person that keeps showing up? Are you the company that just keeps beating the door down at Natick Soldier Center or uh, the GSA, uh, insisting that you're the ones that should be providing this product or this service? Uh, I worked with a company, it's not water, but I worked with a company for 
uh, about 12 years in Minnesota that built wire and cable that kept showing up to Oshkosh, which is when it was in its backyard to sell wires and cables to land systems uh, vehicles. Uh, it took him seven years, not a single sale. The guy kept going routinely every quarter for seven years. And then the DOD put in a, a DX contract, which means we need it now for mine resistant ambush protected MRAP vehicles in Afghanistan. Need them last week. And they said, oh crap, we can't make wires and cables that fast. Who'd they call? That company. Um, were they the best? Not even close. Um, but they knew, they knew they would do them quickly. Um, and they came in and not only gave them the contract, but they brought down uh, experts from the DOD and Oshkosh and helped them improve their line and get these things out to the battlefield. So be that company that maintains those relationships. And similarly, keep showing up. Uh, you know, some folks will go to a trade show or two, or they'll go visit their congressional offices, and then they don't hear back. And another another one I hear all the time is, oh, I went to that I went to that small business procurement conference, and I met with the, the small business liaison officer from Honeywell and Siemens, and they were like, oh, they just we love your technology. We'll call you next week, and, and they never do. They never do. Uh, but they do if you keep showing up because they get tired of seeing you and they got to get you off their back. So it works. Know the requirements. Uh, I talked about this earlier. Um, speak the language, you know, do some research before you show up. Uh, if you build a better uh, backpack water system, uh, know what those basic requirements are, how many gallons per day does an average soldier need, for instance. If you can't find the requirements, create the requirements. A lot of companies are not willing to go into the DOD especially, <clears throat> or any federal government agency and say, here's what you need. But a lot of times these topic authors are sitting there waiting for somebody to come and tell them what they need. Uh, so if you're convinced that you are the hallmark, you're the benchmark for whatever it is service you provide, you know, write up a requirement and say, this is the industry standard. Stand behind that if you can. Match the government's investments. Uh, again, there's a lot of money out there. Uh, the government's willing to invest in you, but you've got to be willing to invest back. And that's not just dollars for what you're producing. It's time, it's energy, it's investment. Reflect that back to them. It's, it's appreciated. Don't bring technology, bring solutions and bring value. So yeah, you've got a really cool hydroelectric generator, okay? So does you know so and so in Oregon and so and so in Minnesota, uh, but you've studied the problem and you're speaking in terms of bringing power to that situation, not a piece of gear that they have to maintain. So talk talk about it that way. If you can bring a small business uh, category, if you are a small business, which is generally 500 people or less, or 17 million I think and less, if you're just a service provider, um, do that and talk about it all day long. The federal government loves small businesses. If you can bring a disadvantaged category or a special category to the table as well, like if you're a woman-owned company or a veteran-owned company, or if you're in a hub zone, um, 8A certified, any of those categories, bring that to the table too. Don't lead with that. A lot of federal government procurement folks are burned by that veteran-owned company that goes up, comes up and says, I'm what you need because I'm better known. No, you're, you're what they need because you built a better mousetrap. And oh, by the way, I'm better known. Number nine, understand your failures. A lot of folks get into this business, especially for SBIR and R&D contracts, and they, they don't get selected, they don't get picked up. Pick up the phone, call the topic author, ask that person why you didn't get selected. It's well worth that five minute call. Sometimes it's, well, you didn't fill out this block, or um, you weren't registered in the SAM system. I don't know, there's all kinds of simple things. Or maybe it's something fundamental that you didn't think of, but the competitor did, they'll, they'll tell you. It's free business intelligence, follow up on your failures. And again, this has kind of been reflected throughout, I think, in my comments, and that is, um, you know, your marketing investment should match your technology investment, right? So you may build the, the greatest, system in the world, 
but you know who's going to know about it? And and do you really bring it to the table in terms of the solutions it provides, not just the technology that it represents? And then some just kind of scattered things that I just kind of collected. Um, transparency and honesty are critical. Uh, if you're not, I don't know, ISO certified, um, if you're not AS9100 manufacturer, uh, be honest about it, be transparent. And a lot of times government providers are willing to work with you or get you certified, uh, but be honest about where you stand. Think about bringing other small businesses to the table. I mentioned AS9100, if you do make something and you wanna sell it to the federal government, uh, a lot of times a manufacturing certification like AS9100 is, is useful to bring with you. If you don't know how to do that, there's, I think Wisconsin has a manufacturing extension partnership. I don't know who that is, but MEP. Great. They, they can bring all kinds of help as far as that goes, sometimes free. Uh, know the terms and conditions of your contract. They're painful to read, but make sure you understand them. If you can bring third party, I shouldn't say that, bring third party testing and validation to the table. So if you make a claim, make sure that you back it up, not just with your own test, spend the money, uh, get somebody else to test it, validate it, and have that certification in your package if you can, if you're doing a proposal. I mentioned having a commercialization path identified. If it's a research project, bring your own investment. If it is considered disadvantaged status, be patient about building relationships. And then, learn, again, learn the language of Department of Defense and contracting. It's, you know, again, I've been doing this for a lot of years, and I still don't get it. But know the basics, um, speak their language. Uh, I mentioned the small business, uh, Roving Blue, earlier. I won't go through this in detail, but they build a really neat uh, battlefield tough water purification kit. Um, and the, the neat thing about this company is they came to us about gosh, five years ago almost now and said, hey, we got this cool thing, would, would, the, would the Pentagon buy this? And I looked at it and it, even with my limited knowledge, I said, well, that handle's going to break off and that hose is going to fail and so I was already given them design requirements. And I, we, we had a forum like this for about an hour and I said, you need to go, these, go do these five things. Guess what they did? They went and did all five things. And we don't often see that, frankly. A lot of small businesses uh, talk the talk and they don't go and do it. They did it and then they did 20 other things. And now they're the gold standard as far as advancing technology in Department of Defense, in my opinion. Uh, and they're right up here or down here. <laughs> yeah, they understand the process. Uh, they understand how to embrace the investment that it takes to get there. They did an amazing job. Uh, and again, I won't belabor this because we've talked, it gets a bit repetitive, but you know, identify what you can bring to the table, know the requirements, communicate a lot with the customer. If you have an improvement or something or a modification uh, or you're writing a new standard, keep communicating that, keep showing up, take the time to develop those relationships, uh, show a way to reduce costs, that's huge. Uh, capability increase is great, but you can do that and lower the cost. That's that's enormous. And deliver. Don't be that company that fails the first time. You know, put everything into it that first time. And then the bonuses. You know, create those requirements if you can. Bring a special status to the table. Bring third-party validation. Bring your own investment. So really it comes down to having solid strategic focus as a company. I mean, do you really want to embrace the federal market? Uh, it, the potential is vast. Nobody moves technology more than Department of Defense, including in water technologies. Uh, but you've got to ask yourself, is that part of your strategic path as a company? And if it is, embrace it and, and reinforce it. I see a lot of companies where they say they're going to do this and they hand it off to, I don't know, a 23 year old marketing person and say, yeah, go figure out this government contracting thing. Well, if you're gonna do that, you know, resource that individual, give them time, send them off to school, do whatever it takes, embrace it. Develop those relationships and then execute on the program. 
And then, of course, use your resources. You got the Water Council, you've got Defense Alliance right over here in Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin Procurement Institute, uh, fantastic PTAC right here in Wisconsin, uh, and then all those other resources I mentioned, like Defense Innovation Marketplace uh, online. Okay, we'll wrap up with some more trivia because I can. When the Aztecs first fought the Spanish conquistadors in 1520, they were baffled by which novel Spanish combat tactic? Trying to kill their opponents. Yes. Before that, it wasn't about that. It was about territory and not killing anyone. Crazy. The CIA frequently offered what to Afghan tribal leaders for information on Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Gold coins, green cards, Viagra, or opium? Viagra. No kidding. This this was huge. In fact, I know the guy that, that did this. He's a Wisconsin or a Minnesota National Guard guy, and he kept watching these tribal leaders um, being bought off by the by the Russians and the Iranians. And every time the CIA would come in with a new pile of cash they'd be on their side for about a week and then they'd be fighting against us again. And it turns out the Iranians would just give them a bigger suitcase of cash, which we were giving to them, long story. Um, <laughs> and so this one guy, this one Lieutenant Colonel in the Minnesota National Guard said, you know, I know what they really could use. These are tribal leaders that have like seven wives and they're in their forties, which in the US is like being in their, over there is like being in their seventies. Uh, so let's just bring them back. Or so the CIA sort of bringing in the blue pill, and they've been loyal ever since. <laughs> so <laughs> sad state of affairs, but we're saving a lot of money. Uh, how were the height and width of U.S. battleships originally determined? They had to fit under the Brooklyn Bridge, and they had to fit through the Panama Canal. Who holds the longest running mercenary contract in history? Here's a hint, they, were, they wear really funky uniforms. Yellow and red with big blossom pants and feathers in their hats. Anyone? Yeah, the Vatican, the Vatican guards uh, from Switzerland. They've been guarding Vatican City since 1505. It's a mercenary force hired by the Catholic Church. They've been wearing the same uniform since then. Uh, you have to be under 30, higher than five foot eight, taller than five foot eight. You have to be single and you have to be Catholic. They have four officers, 23 in non-com, 72 enlisted in one chapel. Cool uniform. All right, last one. As a young Naval officer serving in World War II, what famous American set up the only hamburger stand in the South Pacific? He became a US president. Richard Nixon, it was called Nixon's Snack Shack. He served free hamburgers and Australian beer to flight crews. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, bonus question. So why are helicopter pilots of the sea services considered unrestricted? A, they're just cooler and better looking. B, they all learn to fly fixed and rotary aircraft. C, they can be recalled for non-flight duty. Or D, no good reason, it just ended up in statutes. It's actually A and B, they're cooler and better looking. And we all learn to fly fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft. All right, there you go. So we're a little over, Karen. I think we actually it was 11.30, we had question time, all that. Are there any questions, critiques, comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, uh, is, is it worth doing because you think they're always, the government's always going to pick the big company. 
Well, you know, again, it, it, it's so varied, right, depending on the situation, the technology. And, and, and I've thrown a lot of generalities today. Every case is different. But in terms of just your overall package, right, num so number one is are you bringing true value to the government, right? Are you answering the questions, solving the problem, bringing true value to and whether, whether that means savings or improvement of efficiency or, or capability? That's, you know, it's universal. It's first and foremost, right? Uh, of course, there's exceptions, right? Because the government wants to, you know, meet their quota for 3% woman-owned companies. So unless you're willing to get a sex change, then, you know, move on. Um, but, you know, you said they always pick the bigger company. That's that's actually not been my experience. I, I can quote you some briefly. Some briefly conversations. Well, you like the technology. Well, we want to well, now, so when you say more established, that's interesting, too, because if you are a company that's never worked with the federal government, never received a contract, you don't have any performance history as a contractor, that is a real issue. And and so I would say they do that more often than they pick bigger companies. But maybe that's kind of the same because bigger companies have done more in this and that. Yeah. So, you know, could you bring a partner with you that has managed a contract? And, and maybe that piece of it or a part of it, like the administration or the testing goes to them and you do the manufacturing or whatever the case is, um, that is that is huge. So being that first company, the, the first time you break in to get a contract, it's really, really tough because they, they do want to see past performance. Well, that's one way. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to um, demonstrate past performance in a different way. So maybe you've done contracts that weren't government, but you've got stellar credentials. You've got testimonials. You've got actual outcomes. Uh, you know, find a way to package that and communicate it. That's why I say your marketing piece needs to match your technology piece, because you know the average government, the government's risk averse, right? And they don't they don't want to do anything but a known entity. And you might be known in a different way, just find a way to translate that for them. But yeah, I, I if it's the first time you've done it, it's tough. You know, just tell them you're a member of the Water Council and that, that'll do it right there. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Anything else? Anybody inspired now to go do more government work? <laughs> Are you? <laughs> oh, Lord help you. Yeah. <laughs> so no questions online. Um, I guess the one thing that I wanted to remind everybody is that you know, we don't have to have the Yeah, and let me just add, I, I tend to be a generalist, right? Like any good helicopter pilot, I'm not really good at any one thing. Um, but I, I do connect to a lot of resources, as does Karen, as does the WPI. And that's really what it comes down to is a lot of us are, are connectors, um, resource places. And, you know, if you need questions answered, we may not be able to answer, but we know someone who can almost always. So. Uh, don't give up. I mean, I, I'm just enormously impressed by, with people that actually do things and make things uh, because I've never done that in my life. I've just flown around and fucked off the government for 35 years. Um, no, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, but, but but really not. I mean, it, what what you guys do is is needed and desired and wanted, and it's so hard to get it there. But man, it's when, when you get it there, it's. Uh, it's really rewarding and not just financially.
Great, thanks. Sorry, I'm just typing the last chat. Okay, let me go over here. Um, you know what? We will. Um